I'll be presenting our study of the design and operation of Cloud Lab. Like I mentioned in the lightning talk, this is the study run by the same group of people who b designed it, built it, and operated it. What is Cloud Lab? Again, back to the set in the context. It's a test bed for, uh, it's a distributed test bed for research in cloud computing and uh, distributed systems. The hardware is deployed across three sites, University of Utah, University of Wisconsin, and Clemson University. And the experiments run on physical machines, physical hardware as opposed to virtual machines here. There are over 4,000 users using the um, test bed from different uh, US institutions. And overall, it's a, it's a place where experimenters use the hardware to build the software environments of their choice, whether it's uh, cloud computing or any other flavor of distributed uh, computing. And the way we like to look at it as a laboratory or facility to study in those types of systems rather than an individual system of that type. Back to the map of the hardware resources. Each site in Cloud Lab has its own uh, focus and set of features it provides. Uh, it's got unique set of hardware available. Overall, there are 19 different hardware types available. And you can learn more about them if you go to cloudlab.us. There's a hardware page with all of the hardware specifications. So Cloud Lab was built to support cloud computing and distributed systems research. And it's an interesting topic to see how that mission translates into published work. And here, we looked at uh, recently published papers. Uh, we did a survey of almost 100 pa papers. And we see that research on networking and security aspects of these systems add up almost to 50% of the research use of Cloud Lab. And in this long tail distribution, we see that users use low level uh, access to the hardware. They look for specific features the hardware provides, and also they take advantage of the strong isolation, the performance isolation. Here's why we study Cloud Lab. We would like to better understand how well it serves the needs of the research community. We like to, we would like to anal analyze the impact of the design and implementation decisions and reveal the associated trade-offs. We would also like to generalize the lessons that we learn and make them relevant to the design of other test beds and uh, infrastructure of the service facilities. There are a couple of examples here uh, showing what kind of uh, research requests the facility can serve. So one user can ask for several servers immediately. Another person can come in and ask for m machines of certain, with certain features. There are some requests with specific networking uh, requirements. And also, more on the demanding side, a uh, user can come in and ask for a large set of machines when they become available. And Cloud Lab tries to meet these, uh, fulfill these uh, needs in terms of scale, time, and features. It also tries to guide users to, uh, to help them choose feasible configurations for their experiments. And also, if something goes wrong, the facility needs to provide meaningful and actionable feedback. In this study, we question these, question these goals and try to understand like whether Cloud Lab fulfills these goals or not, how it can accomplish them, and also try to generalize the lessons that we learn in this analysis. We just saw this list, with, which is sort of the user perspective. And in this study, we dive into analysis of uh, these components that are responsible for helping with these goals. We have reservation system, we have constraint system, and we have error reporting system. All right, we're gonna look at the reservation system and to better set the context for this analysis is we need to go back and look at the historic data. This is sort of the measure before you build reference to Ramsey's keynote. So what can we learn from the historic usage data? We've captured a number of metrics related to the growth and usage of the facility. We have, number of, we have the number of uh, servers growing over time we have an increasing user activity 
uh, represented by the number of active users every month. We have a growing number of projects. And we also have the node hours going up where node hours captures how active, the, how busy the facility is. And overall, we can summarize here that we have, so far, we have not found the limit to this demand. All right, we're gonna go one level deeper here and uh, look at uh, this, this second question. Is there enough hardware for everyone? So we started this analysis uh, by looking at individual time plots, time series plots for uh, different hardware types. And we started with this highly volatile plot on the left and we sort of derive this uh, more interpretable in uh, kind of more uh, interesting curve on the right and that's the number percent of the time available as a function of percent of the nodes where in the left top corner we have one machine that is available almost 100% of the time in the right bottom corner we have the opposite 100 machines are almost 100% of the machines are almost never available and we have a nice curve between the two plots we repeat this for different hardware types and we get this nice spectrum of different availability curves. Uh, one of these points here indicate that for this particular hardware type, 200 machines are available 80% of the time. And that's, that's really nice. That, that allows for large experiments. On the other hand, for the uh, hardware, time, hardware type that is most used, uh, we only get, can get 50%, 50 machines for 30% of the time. And that's not so great, but that's still, uh, it's still reasonable. But for this case, we would like to really use reservations. So those users who are interested in the features that that hardware provides, they should submit their reservation requests. And here I have a slide, really just one slide, describing the design of the reservation system. So it all starts uh, with these requests following a particular format where a user needs to specify how many machines he or she needs, the specific type, and the interval of time when the hardware is going to be used. So the accounting on the Cloud Lab side is done per project and on the per hardware basis. These requests are subject to validation checks where users can check if it's feasible or not according to the current schedule before they commit to one of these. And also, um, the, the, the reservation system is built in a way that it, so the experiments are not launched automatically according to these reservations. It's up to the user to come in again at that time and launch their experiments. So this can be compared to hotel reservation system where hotel doesn't check you in in the room when you give them a call and ask for a room. It happens when you arrive at the hotel. Same thing here. User submits an advanced reservation, plans the usage, and then at the time, when the time comes, then he or she launches the experiments. So how, how well does this work in practice? So this uh, reservation system uh, came into production in, at the end of 2017, and we've been gathering information about its usage. So what we can do immediately is look at the uh, sizes and durations of experiments compared to the sizes and durations of approved reservations, this plot at the bottom. So something about reasoning here relates to Ramsey's talk again. It's about careful measurement and careful reasoning. For these types of distributions, we can't just compare averages. We need to look uh, deeper and compare certain percentiles because these are long tail distributions for both of the dimensions. So we do that in the paper and we look at things like medians and 95th percentiles. So we can see uh, quite a difference between the 95th percentile for experiments and 95th percentile for reservations with respect to the duration. Same happens for the number of nodes and other percentiles we've analyzed. And here's our summary for that. Reservations allow users to run longer and larger experiments. That's what our analysis confirms. We'll also look at the timeline when the active, uh, when the uh, reservation system is very active, when it's mostly used. And uh, the increased activity there aligns well with the overall a uh, high utilization of the test bed, which, which, which makes sense. It's a, it's a very intuitive 
uh, summary, when the hardware is busy, people sort of uh, participate in the competition for the resources and they can, they can address it by using the reservation system. Um, this slide here talk, uh, kind of gives us information about reservations allowing users to meet their deadlines and the spikes here correspond to increased activity around the conference deadlines in the spring and in the fall. All right, we're switching gears here. We'll talk about errors. And uh, for this discussion, it's important to note that errors come from the resource mapping phase of uh, the process. It's a complex process where uh, there are a lot of potential scenarios and outcomes. And uh, the system needs to be clear about what's going on and communicate it to the users. Generally speaking, resource mapping can be uh, solved through one of these approaches. So general algorithm would make very few assumptions about the facility and really solve this problem or approach it as a constraint satisfaction and optimization problem. On more specialized and we can design a more uh, custom and more tailored solution that has more knowledge about the facility and can be very particular about its uh, process and its outcomes. So Cloud Lab takes a hybrid approach where there's a general part and more specialized part. So the general part is, is what solves the simulated annealing problem for solving graph isomorphism problem. And on top of that, sort of as a wrapper, we have a set of uh, deterministic heuristics that help improve the feedback. So this is what comes out of this process. These are the errors that we've, uh, the system recorded and we've analyzed. We have top 10 errors produced by Cloud Lab and their frequencies on the right in the column uh, called helpful is really just our own assessment of whether they were helpful and actionable or not. And even though there's some room for improvement, mostly these error messages are, are were, were helpful. We summarize it here uh, with the following statement. So we've identified the common error scenarios and addressed them through the custom heuristics. These numbers add up to about 86% of the last year's errors that we found interpretable and uh, actionable. All right, we're switching gears again and now looking at the constraint system. And uh, there's, uh, the main question here is that, uh, do constraints help avoid some of those errors? So it's, it, it, it's good to set the context here with an analogy. We can compare constraints against the error reporting system where one is similar to the feedback that you get from an IDE and the report system, uh, error reporting system uh, can be compared to the feedback that you get from the compiler. In one case, you get like faster, more interactive feedback before you put in a lot of work. And then once, once that's done, you can compile it. Or in the case of Cloud Lab, you push the button and launch the, you instantiate the experiment. In that case, you get more definitive, uh, more concrete uh, feedback, but you as a user obviously benefit from the early feedback as well. And that's what the constraint system provides. So behind the scenes, there's the valuation procedure built around the Boolean product of sums. I'm not gonna go into details here. You can check it out in the paper. Um, I'll just mention the context in which it's used. So the constraints are um, like show up in two places. It's an interactive topology design and cluster selection. Those are steps in the instantiation of your, when you instantiate your experiment on Cloud Lab. And we summarize here that the constraint system running as a lightweight system in front of the complex and heavyweight mapper uh, procedure improves user experience and helps avoid some of those uh, errors. In conclusion, I'll just mention that we, in this study, analyze three components in the Cloud Labs control framework, the reservation system, the constraint system, and error reporting system. And we have, uh, for each of these components, we have findings and analysis that we present in the paper. One more conclusion slide here. So for Cloud Lab, that, take, uh, that runs reservation system, constraint system, and error reporting system, uh, we, we see that the test bed satisfies diverse research needs, helps the researchers 
find feasible configurations and provides helpful feedback. And the paper presents the data and analysis that back this uh, statement. The data and the code that we've worked with are available at this URL. You can see from the numbers that uh, it's quite a bit of Cloud Labs history. And uh, what's interesting about this repo is that through the binder integration, we made it so that you can not only see the, the, uh, the code, but you can also run it with minimal effort. More about Cloud Lab. So this is my last slide. Go to cloudlab.us and you can sign up for an account if you haven't done so already. And if you want to learn more about it, join our uh, Birds of a Feather session at 7.30 tonight. And that's all I've got. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, Ming from University of Washington. Just curious, how do you do uh, performance isolation in Cloud Lab, especially networking uh, performance isolations? Are there any interesting observations? Right, right. So there are a number of ways to look at that. One would be to, so Cloud Lab offers a set of programmable switches. So you can get your own machines connected to a programmable switch, and then you control how it runs. You control the software and you know, what, what's, what, what goes through that switch. So that's one of the kind of strongest examples of that. I mean, I'll, I'll mention again, I guess, so on the hardware, so on the machine side, you also don't get other users, you don't, you don't see other users using the same machines at the same time. When you have an experiment running on a machine, that's, that's only you, so it's um, explicitly assigned to your experiment. Um, hi, uh, great talk. Uh, I, ha I had a question about the reservations. Uh, how uh, so in case there are multiple reservations for the same kind of hardware and the quantity how is this race condition resolved uh, when there are multiple reservations that are seeking same kind of hardware at the same time span is right. there a way to resolve that right so there's a kind of overall schedule for that hardware type right and so when a reservation comes in uh, the details of the reservation are checked against that schedule if it goes through it's accepted and kind of in the schedule updated when another reservation comes in, then it, it might not fit in and it'll be rejected. So is it like, is it like, is it on first come first serve basis? For the reservations, uh, yes, in, in that, so. So if you get multiple requests for an empty, like unassigned hardware at the same time, how do you decide which one to, which request would you assign based on the timestamp? I mean, yeah, in practice, they'll never be exactly simultaneous, right? So they'll, they'll have some, some difference of, in time. Okay. And also, it depends on the class or, or size of reservation. Small reservations will be granted automatically, if, if possible, and longer ones will be reviewed by the admins, and that's okay. how the conflicts can be resolved. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, one more question. Uh, Thomas from Theovin. So what type of metrics does your platform provide for experiment run? So what type of um, metrics are, are people who run experiments interested in? It's like energy consumption or network traffic? So you can, you can collect and so measure and collect all that yourself. So we don't, we don't really do so that. So I have to do that myself. Apart right. From this we capture some lightweight like CPU utilization metrics, but that's mostly for different reasons for understanding if the experiment is active or not, and we can ask people to release the resources if the utilization is low, but it's really up to you to yeah, dive, okay. like dive deep and capture all the Thanks. interesting metrics. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.